It's oh, Michael. going fine here. Uh, Mike, you know. Oh, uh, yes, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> I'm already messing it up. Yeah. Yes, I am Mike. I like Mike. <laughs> okay, perfect. Because we don't, we don't call Michael Mike, so this works out great. <laughs> so how's it going over there in Hawaii? Well, uh, it's unusually cool for this time of year. Uh, otherwise, it's uh, you know alternating between uh, showers and sun, and we're getting into tourist weather. It's uh, tourist season, but they won't let us shoot any of them. <laughs> I understand they taste like chicken, and in this economy, that may become an issue. That's, yeah. <laughs> oh, no. So you said it's you said it's a little cool over there. So uh, what's up? No, no, no uh, global warming. Uh, not here, and certainly not across uh, many parts of the United States. Uh, they've got actually frost warnings in a lot of states for tonight. They're getting more snow around Las Vegas and California, Big Bear. Uh, all these uh, tourist areas were getting ready to start their springtime and, and summer activities. They're having to delay them. So, uh, yeah, I'm afraid this whole global warming thing really didn't work out quite the way Al Gore wanted it to. Yeah. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, so, so when when is everything going to melt? Uh, <laughs> well, it will sometime, but uh, you know, very obviously, uh, the, the reality is the Earth has been cooling for about twelve, thirteen years now. The Arctic ice caps are increasing, and unfortunately, the people who are pushing this global warming situation, uh, they're driven partly by the desire to sell us products, agendas, carbon taxes, carbon credits and partly by the fact that they've bet their reputations on this human-caused global warming, and they're trying to figure a way where they can somehow get out of this without looking like they were part of, at the very most generous, a horrendous scientific goof, uh, or more realistically, they were part of this agenda to take something that happens naturally, claim it was all the fault of human beings to guilt us out of money and obedience. Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, people are are waking up. I would assume by now. I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't assume much. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't, don't don't assume that completely because we still have people that think the Earth is flat. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is true. I, I, Mike, I don't know if, if you've uh, been with us since that last time, but we've been uh, doing a lot of debating with flat Earthers. There's a lot of people who believe the, the Earth is actually flat. Uh boy, that's that's a that's a tough one to. To get into, and I, uh, I, I understand that the Bible teaches that, but I sort of hope that we devolve past that stage. Yes, yeah. we did too until about a month ago. <laughs> you sure it's not somebody pulling your ankle? Oh no, 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 no! They These are people are real. dead serious. We thought that they were at first, but no, they're they're really uh, they're serious. It's yeah. we we actually we actually did a show. <clears throat> not that I wanted to give it a lot of attention, but. We ended up doing a show, and we had a physicist come on, and we talked about it with him. So, and uh, yeah, and I put that up on YouTube, and so people that go and search for flat Earth, they come up, they come to that, and uh, it's mostly these flat Earthers that are coming up. So there's, there's like, probably like, I mean, there's like, I don't know, fifty or sixty dislikes compared to like maybe like ten likes on on oh, yeah. the video right now. <laughs> That's that's definitely a, a little bit out there, and uh, that, that, that's that's definitely out there. But you know, unfortunately, people can be slaves to belief. Uh, it's it's a big issue. Uh, that's what's driving a lot of the adherence to uh, uh, to the global warming agenda. Uh, a lot of Hillary's support is just from people who believe that she's <laughs> whatever it is she pretends to be. Oh. I believe she's psychotic. Uh, sociopathic. I, I'll go as far as sociopathic. And uh, uh, sociopaths, unfortunately, make very, very good, convincing liars and, and wonderful politicians. Yep. That's what they do. Wow. So, uh, so fast, uh, track. I, fast track was today. Fast track. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It got, yeah. today? got declined, right? No, nah, it did originally. No, no. Then the yeah. Democrats made a came up with a compromise situation, and 
uh, yeah, it's now moving forward. Now, it may be fast-tracked here in the United States where Congress is just doesn't want to be bothered with the negotiations, just like they don't want to be bothered declaring war, but by golly, they want to be involved in the possibility that we might make peace with Iran. Uh, but it's still a long ways away from actually getting the treaty signed by all these other uh, nations who are part of this, uh, mostly because uh, there's a lot of stuff that's been added in there. A lot of nations are very concerned about the loss of sovereignty, uh, their, their own governmental functions being transferred uh, literally to corporate bodies. Uh, a lot of the countries are very bothered by some of the uh, uh, amendments that were put in there regarding uh, GMO labeling. Uh, the TPP and the uh, TTIP both basically ban GMO labeling. Israel's trying to get this treaty to include uh, a ban on the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement around the world. Uh, and it, there, it's meeting a lot of resistance. And the U.S. is trying to arm twist people to go along with it because the ultimate goal of all of these treaties is the U.S. is desperate to try and lock the world back into a, a U.S.-dominated economic system, similar to Bretton Woods in the post-World War II years, or the world under the petrodollar, uh, before the U.S. dollar really starts to come apart, at which point everybody's just going to head for the uh, exits and not want to be part of this any longer. But uh, uh, we're, we're at a situation where the U.S. Is, is trying to basically get the world back to the Bretton Woods-like agreement, where it doesn't matter what happens to the dollar because the rest of the world is locked to the dollar. Uh, but I, I think a lot of the other countries are not going to go for it. Certainly Russia and China are adamant they are not going to sign on to any economic agreement that basically cedes their sovereignty to the United States or to United States corporations. Oh, yeah, the dollar is tanking. I keep thinking it's going to be the bottom, but it just keeps going down. So I mean, Well, remember in a currency war, they're actually trying to lower its value, but the U.S. is losing the currency war, and it's getting pretty desperate out there right now. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. It, seemed, it almost seems like the euro is overpowering the dollar, or is it about well, to? Well, not, not the euro <laughs> so much. The euro and the dollar have been sort of maintaining parity all along. The real problem is the rise of the ruble the renminbi and the yuan, which right. are very powerful currencies. And you've got uh, all these parallel financial systems being set up, like BRICS and the uh, uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. And yep. they're all basically operating outside the U.S. dollar. Uh, and that, of course, means that Wall Street does not get a piece of the action. See, at the end of World War II... Uh, the U.S. government's price to Great Britain to bring the American people into World War II was that the British pound sterling would surrender its role as the global trade and banking currency and allow the dollar to take over. Now, back during World War II, when accounts were still being settled with bullion or boxes of paper notes, it did make sense to have a single global currency that everybody could rely on. In these days of global instantaneous financial transactions, it's really an obsolete concept. But what happened is the United States made a huge amount of money just being the global currency because before anybody could conduct commerce across a border, they would first have to come to the Federal Reserve and borrow dollars at interest, or they would have to bring manufactured goods and agricultural produce to the United States to get those ink and paper tickets. And so literally the U.S. was making a huge profit off the fact that the dollar was the global trade and banking currency. And over the subsequent decades, Wall Street got kind of lazy. They started saying, we don't need to manufacture. We don't need to grow food. We can let all the high-paying jobs go to other countries because we're making this guaranteed income from Bretton Woods. Then Nixon ended gold convertibility, which technically was the end of Bretton Woods. And the U.S. went out and they established the petrodollar deal, where the U.S. went to all the resource-rich oil companies, mostly in the Middle East, and they said, we'll make you a deal. As long as you saw, sell your oil only for U.S. dollars and invest those dollars in the U.S., we will guarantee your military safety. And so once again, the world had to come borrow dollars at interest in order to buy oil or bring us products and agricultural produce for those ink and paper tickets before they could buy oil. And that deal kept global demand for the dollar high up until recently. Uh, but starting back basically at the turn of the millennium, a lot of countries started saying there's no reason for us to have a single global currency. And in 2002, 
Iraq got permission from the United Nations to start selling Iraq's oil for the euro. One year later, the United States screaming weapons of mass destruction invades Iraq, lynches Saddam Hussein, puts in a new puppet government, and Iraq's oil is on the world market, but only for the U.S. dollar. Over in Libya, you had Muammar Gaddafi shut down their private central bank, set up a state bank with a brand new value-based currency, the gold dinar. Then he announced to the world that Libya's oil was for sale, but only for the gold dinar. The U.S. invades, they kill Gaddafi, they put in a private central bank, the gold for the gold dinar. Nobody knows where that went. And Libya's oil is back on the world market, but only for the dollar. And that's really what's driving a lot of this war agenda to just keep all global commerce going through the U.S. dollar, from which Wall Street and the Federal Reserve make a huge amount of money. And unfortunately, we're starting to see all these parallel systems start up, BRICS, uh, Asian uh, Infrastructure Investment Bank, and the U.S. is trying to stop that with these transoceanic treaties. And they're running into a lot of resistance. And frankly, the only thing the United States has got to negotiate with is you go along with us on the treaty or we'll overthrow your government the way we did Kiev, put in a puppet ruler, and your successor will do what we want. And that's what's brought this world right literally to the edge of a nuclear world war. Uh, you, you just broke it down exactly the way it is. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I have a question. Uh, you said the Russian ruble is getting stronger, but I thought it went down 50%. I think it was these last couple months. It went down briefly because the U.S. and Saudi Arabia put together this little deal to crush world yeah. oil prices. And uh, Russia's economy, export economy, is very heavily into oil and gas, and it did harm Russia's ruble, but it kind of backflashed against uh, United States oil companies. A lot of fracking companies went out of business. Canada's oil company was uh, suffering huge losses. Venezuela has been put to the edge of bankruptcy by this. And Russia's economy is already rebounding from the sanctions. So is Iran's, because there are way too many countries on planet Earth who are just willing to ignore what the U.S. wants and continue to carry out commerce. You've even got Boeing in the United States and Germany starting to do business with Iran again. And pretty much all of Europe is saying it's time for these Russian sanctions to go. They're hurting us more than they hurt the Russians. It's just the U.S. out there trying to throw its weight around and bully everybody into going back to the 1950s when, you know, again, the United States and the dollar was the center of all global commerce. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like, so uh, like pretty much the uh, ruble recovered a little, did it? Uh, yeah, it has. They're they're actually doing very well over there. Nice. So, what do you think their plans are for the dollar? Are they just trying to make it stronger? Try to, like you said, some sort of new uh, Bretton Woods right. agreement. Something well, the Bretton Woods agreement is to basically lock all of the world's economies back to the dollar. Uh, so it doesn't matter whether the dollar goes up or down because everybody else's currencies will go up and down with it together. Uh, the, the other currencies are pegged to the dollar. The exchange rates are locked that way. And that's what the original Bretton Woods did. But I, I, I don't think they're, they're going to be able to get enough nations to come on board where it's really going to do much of anything except isolate the United States and those who signed the treaty from the rest of uh, the world's economy. And, you know, uh, Asia is booming up, huge manufacturing uh, capacity over there. Russia, they're able to run their economies without the United States. And that is really the part that is considered a threat to the United States, is you have countries around the world doing business with each other without going through the dollar. Uh, China has signed eight direct currency exchange agreements, uh, with uh, other nations, including Russia, and amazingly, Australia. Even Australia is saying, we don't need to go through the dollar to do business with China. And because the United States financial system stopped thinking of itself as a manufacturing and agricultural power and saw itself merely as the financier to the world, uh, they've become dependent on that mafia-like piece of the action from everybody else's right. commerce, and that's why they're willing to start initiating wars to drag the world back to the way it was in the 1950s. And they're meeting a tremendous oh. amount of resistance. Hmm. So what happens next? Well, next we're, almost, we're almost in a bit of a race 
between the U.S. actually getting a major war with peer nations going uh, or the implosion of the U.S. economy. And obviously, from the point of view of the government and Wall Street, uh, they would like to see a major war because then they got somebody to blame the mess on. If the U.S. economy implodes and Wall Street and Washington, D.C. don't have somebody to blame, the American people are going to point the finger of blame where it truly deserves to be, corrupt Wall Street money junkies and their lackeys in the United States government. And the United States has a history. Every time they get into one of these self-created financial hotspots, they get out of it or at least distract from it with a world war. Crash of 1907, World War I. Crash of 1929, World War II. Crash of 2008. Look how many nations the United States has invaded, bombed, drone struck, or tried to overthrow. Uh, yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. It looks like we're uh, headed towards a war now. I mean, um, and then you got oil. Price of oil looks like it's going to start going back up in the next month. You know, yeah. Kind of, so, I mean, uh, it usually seems to coincide with that. And uh, <laughs> we'll see. I mean, um, do, do you think the the conspiracy theories about the government wanting to do a one world, <clears throat> excuse me, one world currency are in any way legitimate? Oh, absolutely, because uh, the private central bankers have always wanted the entire world underneath their system. And any nation that tries to operate without a private central bank gets attacked. And this has been going on for hundreds of years. Over at my website, whatreallyhappened.com, I have an article in the permanent menu up at the top called All Wars Are Bankers Wars. Uh, it's a very popular article. Some of the fans have literally made videos around it. And it points out right. that... All of these, all of these wars can be explained as a contest between the private central bankers wanting to keep their debt enslavement mechanism versus those countries trying to break free. Uh, the uh, un American Revolution was actually fought to free the United States from the Bank of England, which was a private central bank that issued all the public currencies alone at interest. And as soon as the revolution was over, the bankers were in the United States trying to bribe members of the government trying to, to, to get a new private central bank, and they succeeded, the first bank of the United States, primarily through the uh, help of Alexander Hamilton, who was always the banker's man inside the young United States. And the first bank of the United States had a 20-year charter, and at the end of the charter, uh, anybody could see that the bank had simply gathered to itself all the real wealth of the nation and put it in their pockets and impoverished everybody else. So Congress refused to renew the charter, the Rothschilds actually threatened the United States government, if you do not renew our charter, we will start a war with you. Congress stood firm, and the Rothschilds went to King George III and said, we will finance a new war against the American colonies at virtually zero interest so you can bring them back to colonial status. And that was the cause of the War of 1812. So even though the United States won the War of 1812, uh, it so bankrupted them they were forced to accept a new private central bank, the second bank of the United States, which had a 20-year charter. And at the end of that 20 years, President Andrew Jackson ran for his second term on the slogan, Jackson and no bank. And he was adamant he was going to shut that second private bank down, and he did. And by the way, he's the only American president to ever pay off the national debt. And as soon as he succeeded in shutting down the second bank of the United States uh, as a central bank, uh, there was an immediate assassination attempt on him, which failed when both pistols failed to fire. The Second Bank of the United States tried to run as a normal depositor bank, uh, but went out of business in about two years. Because depositor banks that you are familiar with on Main Street USA and these central banks are two completely different operations. Private central banks are legalized counterfeiting operations where they create money out of thin air, loan it into circulation at interest, and then just sit back and reap the profits from it. And it, they, they only exist because in every government there's always some group of people who can be bought and bribed to sell their people back into the slavery of that system. That's what happened in the United States a little over 100 years ago, when a corrupted president and a corrupted Congress sold the American people back into the exact same type of predatory banking system we fought a revolution to, be, uh, to break free of. It was supposed to be called the Third Bank of the United States, but at the last minute they changed it to the Federal Reserve, figuring the name federal would fool people into thinking it was part of the U.S. government. But it isn't. It's no more federal than Federal Express. Right, right. <laughs> well said. Did, Michael, what, do you, uh, what are your thoughts on Bitcoin? Uh, I, um, think I, bit, 
I think any currency operating outside the central banks is a good idea. We've seen mm. Bitcoin come under attack. Uh, the Federal Reserve uh, is jealous over its monopoly for public currency, even though they're not allowed to have a monopoly under U.S. law. We are legally allowed to decide for ourselves what medium of exchange we're going to use. But we've seen the U.S. government come down on, like, the Ron Paul dollar and the Liberty dollar. Uh, and they're, they're trying to basically discredit and destroy Bitcoin because they do not want us using currency on which we are not paying interest to the Federal Reserve. I'll give you a little uh, uh, history about the John F. Kennedy assassination. Uh, we all know that the Warren Commission was a, a big lie. And we know there were a lot of people who hated John F. Kennedy. One group that hated him was the Federal Reserve, because Kennedy signed an executive order, uh, Executive Order 11110, that started issuing from the United States Treasury a new currency called the United States Note, based on value, based on silver in Fort Knox. And he put about $4.5 billion into circulation, which powered American commerce without generating interest payments to the Federal Reserve. Five months later, Kennedy was shot dead in Dealey Plaza, Dallas, Texas, and on the Warren Commission sat John J. McCloy, president of the Chase Manhattan Bank, president of the World Bank. And I don't care how good a banker he is, he's not qualified to be investigating the murder of a president. Therefore, he was on the Warren Commission to make sure the link between the assassination and the financial sector remained hidden. Wow. How about that? Never even saw that. Well, that's pretty well you cool. know, I mean, the, the, guy, yeah. the guy who shot at Andrew Jackson, you know, when they said, why'd you do it? He said, well, with Jackson dead, money would be more plenty. Uh, we know that uh, Lincoln was assassinated after announcing he was going to keep his greenbacks in circulation that he'd used to finance the Civil War without selling the, uh, the North into the uh, debt slavery of the banks again. That's right. Yeah. So to get to this one world currency, what do they have to do at this point? Do they have to destroy the dollar or do they want to destroy the dollar? Uh, I think to get to the one world currency, they're going to have to convince all the people of the world that there needs to be a single economic system, a single central bank. That's going to be a hard sell. Uh, obviously, if there is a global financial crash, uh, the carpetbaggers are going to be standing up and saying, we've got a brand new economic, global economic system all set to go. All you have to do is sign on the dotted line and we'll be good to go. And obviously we don't want to do that. They're just going to be restarting the same system again. And it's a system of debt slavery because the way private central banks are designed, they generate more debt than money with which to pay the debt. You can never get rid of that debt no matter how hard you work, no matter how much you sacrifice, the debt grows and grows until it destroys your country, like Greece, or your planet, like Earth. And this is not about money and wealth. It's about ruling the human race through the illusion of debt, rule by right. banker. And it's no more legitimate a form of governance than rule by divine right or rule by slavery. And like those former failed systems, it only works as long as people allow themselves to be brainwashed into thinking, into believing this is the way the world is supposed to be. And you will notice that after the Federal Reserve came into being, our public schools stopped teaching about King George III's Currency Act and uh, the Bank of England being the primary cause of the revolution. It was, oh, it's tea in Boston Harbor, and it's all this other stuff here. So the, you, you say it, it, it's going to be a hard sell, or it would be a, a hard sell, um, meaning you, uh, other countries aren't going aren't gonna to go for it? Well, when you surrender control of your monetary system, you're literally surrendering a huge part of your sovereignty and independence. Okay. And I think most people, are going to, most people are going to say, well, if we're having to go to just one bank, we're for all intents and purposes, that is the new world order. And that is the goal of the new world order. One bank, one planet, one people living perpetually in debt slavery. Right, right. <laughs> but I, I, I can see it being kind of an easy, uh, easy sell. You know, um, that make it make it sound wonderful. Make I think it look most good, people yeah. like most a utopia, look, global global utopia. Well, look how badly. I mean, these are the same people who've messed up the global economy to this point over the last mm -hmm. hundred years, and I think po most people are going to say we're not going to give you a second chance here. Let's go back to having little coins made out of valuable metal so. in our pockets, and we'll work out our commerce for ourselves because. Oh, yeah. 
you you know if you don't have control over your own money, then you're already a slave. And ever since 1913, the Federal well, Reserve okay. has been taking away control of your money from you. When the United States was started, the the dollar was a weight measure of silver. That silver was the dollar. The paper notes weren't the money. They were a claim check for convenience. But you could take that paper note to the bank and get a dollar's worth of silver for a dollar note anytime you wanted. Uh, then they got rid of the uh, silver standard, and they started convincing everybody that that paper note was the money. And once they were able to do that and delink it from silver, we've seen the value of the dollar decline to the point where a U.S. dollar today is worth about seven cents compared to the dollar as it existed at the start of the Federal Reserve. Right. And now they want to take away your ability to even have your money in your own pocket. We're already hearing all this talk about a cashless society where yep. all the money is the property of the banks. It's always in the bank. You've got a little card that just moves it from one bank to another bank, but you're mm-hmm. never allowed to have money in your pocket any oh, no, longer. A chip in your hand. Do you think that would take a lot of the, the drug business out? Because like, they do mostly cash transactions. Uh, I don't think it would slow the drug business one tiny bit because people can always buy things for barter. Buy things, yep, and yep. and right. let's let's be honest, most of the drug traffic right now in this country is being run by the Central Intelligence Agency. Mm-hmm. And so, mm-hmm. you know, at, at this point, they'll always find a way to make it pay. Uh, there may be a cashless society for uh, us in the in the city streets, but they'll there's still going to be gold bars and 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 coins and silver and and jewels that can be used as medium of exchange for the for the big crimes, and they're they're untraceable. Sure. Yep. Yeah. So they have the cartels pushing the drugs, I would imagine, and um. So yeah, yeah. And, and go after whoever does up at the top. Okay, you were breaking up then. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, Jeff, you were breaking up. We didn't right. hear what you said. Well, speaking of the financial collapse, um, I guess we could move on to this Jade Helm situation that's going on. We've talked a little bit about it, and uh, I've heard a lot of different uh, crazy stuff about it, conspiracy theories. Like the one that really gets me is the uh, Walmart death camps. But. Yeah, that's a little out there. And <laughs> yeah. what you what you need what you need to remember is when the public is getting on to an issue, uh, the government likes to employ a propaganda tactic called poisoning the well, in which they will go out and plant some utter nonsense uh, in yep. order to discredit the entire conversation. Uh, I'll give you a good example. Um, when the House Select Committee on Assassinations was taking another look at the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Uh, they made a big deal about the so-called umbrella man who'd been standing next to the motorcade route with an open umbrella, and they said, oh, it's a poison dart gun, and it paralyzed Kennedy, and that's why you couldn't move out, out of the shots. And they got the umbrella in there, and they opened it up and showed it's just an umbrella and said, oh, see, it's just, don't point that thing at me, oh, just to make fun of the whole uh, <laughs> issue. Uh, but thanks to the audio data, uh, in the end, uh, the uh, House Select Committee was forced to acknowledge that, yes, there had been multiple shooters in Dealey Plaza, and there was, therefore, actually a conspiracy. Yeah, oh, well, so, so, so uh, th- yeah, I agree. That's that's how I think of it, and it's a good way of putting it, putting uh, poisoning the well. And, and I kind of saw through that right away, and I saw how people were just making fun of uh, the whole Walmart thing, and it kind of just... Yeah, uh, you're breaking up again, Jeff. Okay, well, let me talk about the Walmart situation. Yeah. Uh, Walmart, as you know, uh, was dealing with, for lack of a better word, an employee insurrection. And as a result of it and the public attention that was created, they had to raise wages for their workers. Well, if you look at the Walmarts that were announced that they were being closed without warning because of plumbing problems, those are the very stores where the protests began. So this was Walmart just, uh, you know, getting back at the workers who had started this whole push for higher wages by closing the sure. stores and just and letting yeah. them all go. Okay. Uh, so that's what's and, going on with, with that situation. But and, the and, who are, and nothing more? No, they're, they're not... Walmart death camps, then? No, no, no. That's being not, put out there. 
yeah. that's being put put out there deliberately to make people who are concerned about Jade Helm look like nutcases and kooks. Yes. In fact, that that's the term they use, kookification. Mm-hmm. That's I a propaganda it. term. <laughs> now, what we, we, we we've all been keep, saying that. Yeah, well, here's here's the thing. I do think it is in this case just a training exercise and yep. a bit of a, a showing off to the American people about, you know, how big and tough the government can be if they want to be. And the reason I think it's only an exercise is because it's only taking place in 10 states, although I think Colorado just pulled out of it. Uh, uh, they, they couldn't do a takeover in just 10 states because the other 40 states would immediately start, you know, arming their borders here. Uh, but we do need to be concerned right. about what it is they're training to do, which is house-to-house searches, rounding up people, putting them in camps very clearly. This is a rehearsal by the United States government to declare war on the American people. And we should be concerned about that. We should be focused on that aspect of it and not get distracted off by all these wild stories about, you know, uh, stacks of coffins hidden in the back of the Walmart <laughs> and the rest of it. No, no. Do you think it's a, a little bit of um, uh, what's the right word for it? Uh, g- getting us used to it, you know? I like, don't. Like, like, I I don't know that they're going to get us used to it. I think most people who are looking at it are absolutely appalled at what's going on. And uh, I I don't see them as as being comfortable with it. There are a lot of people who are already angry about it. Uh, Some of them are letting their imaginations get the better of them. But, um, Mm -hmm. yeah. Certainly. Well, see, and I I can see them as being like a, uh, well, conditioning, just more conditioning, you know. (laughs) <laughs> that's why I, I agree with you as far as I, I think it's probably just a, just a training exercise and and uh, but, but I believe a lot of it is conditioning uh, you know get, getting us used to the, the being able to do this all the time and yeah. there is people that are, that are angry about it and pissed off and with good reason and should be but you know realistically there's a whole hell of a lot of people that aren't and very docile and could care less too so um i would be very cautious about mistaking silence for consent for one yeah, thing good point. Mo- yeah most americans understand that us army in the streets of america uh, is a violation of posse comitatus now of course mm-hmm. the government's position is this is just a training exercise it's not for real therefore it's okay for the army to be in the streets but we also know there's another area of concern we need to pay attention to and that is that every time there's one of these false flag terror attacks there's always a drill taking place at exactly the same time which provides cover for getting assets in and out of the area and make sure that the uh, the environment is completely controlled when it all goes down. When 9-11 happened, FEMA had been on the ground in New York from the day before, practicing a scenario of hijacked aircraft crashing into buildings. Right. During the 7-7 subway bombing in London, there was an ongoing security uh, drill about backpack bombs left on the train. There was a similar backpack bomb drill taking place when the Boston bombing took place. We know now that uh, during this recent incident down in Garland, Texas, SWAT teams were already in place when these two would-be shooters uh, came in through the lobby. And since it was all over and done with for 15 seconds, you have to ask, okay, what was SWAT doing there? Well, there was a drill going on. And so we need to be very careful if in the middle of one of these drills, There's a big bang, and all of a sudden the drill starts to go live, and that's obviously something that a lot of people are very, very concerned about. Sure, sure. And and, and uh, at the same aspect is where you get a lot of people that are taking off with very wild conspiracy theories. So, which again, you know, I understand the worry, but you're going to be, you know, realistic. Yeah, realistic at the same time. Yeah, so. we, we yeah we we do have to be realistic, okay? So, yeah, definitely, definitely. But I can see the con- the, the concern, of course. I'm concerned about it. It's it's I don't I don't think it's, it's, it's right. It's good to be aware. And, 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 you, and you're 100 percent about the, there's a there's a whole lot of people that are very silent and that you know aren't like us that you know 
talk about it on a daily and and whatnot. But you know, I, I try to talk to a lot of people, coworkers. You know, I I, I deal with the public, and and, and you know, they're, they're, I don't know. There's just a lot of people that are blind to. I mean, they don't even know about our dollar. Say nothing about you know everything else. Well, so. they're just you know caught in the rat race. I got oh, yeah. time to think about this. Well, my experience is a little different because uh, as I go around, I, I as an experiment, I'll, I'll talk to people at the, the supermarket. Right. Yeah, and, me too. And when you start talking and bringing the stuff up, you will find they're they're pretty clued in. They're pretty clued yeah. into what's going on. Okay. All right. Maybe geographically, it, it, it's it's. Uh... I find a little bit of the opposite. Sometimes they get shocked. Sometimes I, I love it when like I, I get totally floored and like I bring it up like uh, to a little old lady or something, and we start just start talking and you know in line at the grocery store and get blown away by it. I've had that happen. Well, there's something fishy about that nine eleven. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's more people willing to entertain these ideas. It's not becoming crazy. It's becoming mainstream. And we're just, you know, we're going to be accepting these types of things in the future, I think. Well, that's, I think well, that's a big problem. See you a little bit too much hope there. <laughs> so so this isn't going to take 100 years to play out then, is it? This is seems to be coming to, into fruition in our lifetime. Well, I certainly don't see how the economy is going to make it to the end of the year. I mean, Greece I is so. basically out of money. They've got Same, more of yeah, these yeah. payments coming up yeah. to the uh, to the Troika. They can't possibly make it. Uh, the bankers can't hide the fact that Greece is not making the payments. There are trillions in dollars of credit default swaps that were purchased against Greece's debt that are going to come due. And uh, even though Wall Street has indicated that they're just going to pretend that they aren't really defaults, the people holding those defaults are not going to go along with that. And so I, I think one of the reasons the U.S. government is practicing all of these uh, military takeover tactics is because it's not going to hold together much longer. It, it, really, it can't. It, when Greece goes, uh, you're going to see a, uh, a lot of other nations in Europe are going to start talking about leaving the Eurozone. Uh, Portugal and Italy are yep. already talking about leaving the, the Eurozone. Uh, there are trillions of dollars in credit default swaps sold across all of Europe's debt. And when that starts to come apart, those people are going to be pounding on the doors of Wall Street, wanting their money. Wall Street doesn't have it because derivatives are not regulated. They don't have to maintain cash reserves. Wall Street sure. will turn around to the federal government and say, please, we need another bailout. We bailout, made well. Yep. And, you know, and uh, the U.S. government will turn to the American people and say, we need another few trillion dollars from you. And the American people are going to say, we don't have it. And that's when things are going to get ugly. Yeah, you know, I was just listening to some people today talk about how we're in another housing bubble and it's about to pop and you're going to be able to buy uh, houses for 10 cents on the dollar again. Well, I don't know if it's going to be quite that low, but uh, unfortunately, you need to understand the Wall Street sharpsters love volatility. Uh, they love bubbles because that's how the giant fortunes are made in a very, very short amount of time. And because Wall Street didn't have to pay the losses from the collapse of the mortgage-backed security fraud in 2008, they had no reason not to go and start doing it again. Right. They're bundling student loans. They're bundling car insurance. They're even bundling home security contracts. And they're once again out there. Uh, they're now doing subprime auto loans. They're doing yep. exactly what they Fair. did before because they made a fortune and they dumped the losses on the American taxpayer. Sure. And that, of course, is fascism. And there's very, very bad money going again, yeah, being lent again. Um, oh, oh, I know what I wanted to ask you. Right, so hey, you're saying by, the, by the end of the year, is that what you had said? Yeah, yes, I, I I don't see us able to to reach the end of the year without a major major economic implosion. I hear a lot of people talking now. about September. Well, you know, it's hard to be a prognosticator because we're all trying to make our forecasts and predictions on the basis of the rules. Uh, but the other side uh, is constantly changing the rules, and they have those printing presses that they can run whenever they need yep. uh, to try and cover things up. But it, it, it's a rock and a hard place situation because the more the Federal Reserve runs those printing presses, the more the rest of the world wants to drop using the dollar. And then you have the U.S. government saying, if you dare drop the U.S. dollar, we will come in and bomb you. Mm. Yep. 
seems to be what's going on. So, um, World War Three coming up potentially. <laughs> Actually, I think stopped? we're already in it. I think oh, yeah, we're that, already in that's, it. That's that's yep. That's what I said. I, I'm pretty Can sure. Can it be that, stopped that, before oh, the climax oh, then? Really. That's what I'm trying to do. I've been trying to head this thing off for 21 years now, and, uh, you, you know, it's it's going to come right down to the wire, unfortunately. Mm. Well, well. That's not very uh, optimistic. Well, if you wanted optimism, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Come on, man. Well, can, we, can we sugarcoat this a little bit? You and your I don't think so. I don't think so. <laughs> no, 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 no. Oh, I guess not. You know, realistic is better than optimistic. I agree. You know, like you be optimistic about what's gonna the aftermath. I mean, yeah, uh, will we will we spring up from it? Will we win in the end? I mean, uh, I just hope well, it doesn't right. get to the climax and uh, millions, hundreds of millions of people I, don't die. Uh, I like to be cynical and optimistic at the same time. Oh, well, that's a heck of a sure. juggling act. <laughs> he, does it, he does it. I see him do it all the time. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll 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 tell you what. What I see happening in the United States is going to be a repeat of what happened to the former Soviet Union, where the central government just collapses from corruption, financial mismanagement, uh, the accumulation of their own lies, and uh, there'll be about maybe four months of really hard times when we're all going to have to take care of each other and look out for each other because there's going to be nobody out there to do that. And then we'll form a new republic, and things will be better. That's what happened in the Soviet Union. They, they, they crashed it for rough months. The new Russian republics are out there. I mean, they're leaving us in the dust with their space program. They're getting ready to go to Mars. We can't even yes. get our own people up to the right. space station anymore. Only four months. This sounds beautiful. A new republic. It, it oh, does. Please. Yeah, please, <laughs> please. Well, that's that's it, that's our best outcome. That's a, that's our best. Uh, uh, it is certainly. I have four it, months it, of food right now. I'm with Jeff, though. It, sa- it sounds so good. Like, you know, just get get, get it over with, and us that have been preparing, or like know. six months of food. The cats all have like six months of food. We'll be fine. Right, and then you right. eat the cats. Oh, I hope they, not. they need the cat. <laughs> yeah. I hope not. I just hope not. I hope it doesn't get that bad. It's yeah, I, I, it's not going to get that bad. Well, we, we well we'll start with oh, the members of Congress because yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, they yeah. taste like chicken and they're not radioactive and uh, you know. yeah. So worst case scenario, we live out in the woods. There's a lake nearby. I would go fishing and hunting first, of course. Okay, since, I mean, you know, we're being realistic, and that's obviously best-case scenario, what's what's worst-case scenario? I, I would send half of, half, of them, half of us to FEMA camps? And, and, well, you uh, know, that gets, that, that, you know, a lot of people like to talk about that, but if the U.S. government puts us in FEMA camps, that they're going to have to take care of us somehow, mm-hmm. uh, and we're not going to be available to work in the farms and factories and fields here. Now, I have no doubt that probably some certain individuals will be targeted, but this idea that we're all going to be in the camps, that's a little out there, which is why when Poroshenko started talking about throwing the ethnic Russians in concentration camps in Ukraine, a lot of people are beginning to think he's lost his sanity over there. Yeah, I I fear something like that will happen. We're going to have an economic collapse, and then everyone who's starving out in the streets will be gathered and put into camps. And then we'll have a, a economic workforce that can finally compete with China again. Well, the the problem with that, we competed successfully with China because we were leaders in technology. But during that whole uh, transition where Wall Street said we don't need to bother with manufacturing, they started basically selling the technology off to other countries. And they allowed these other countries to take over the technological lead. And those countries are never going to let it go back. The only way we could really restore America is we need a new civilian technology incubator because the prosperity of the 70s, 80s, and 90s all tracked back to the race to the moon, which created all these new technologies, which led to all these new products, and America could compete with China because we had the patents on those technologies and those products, and then they got sold off, and that's... It's like they strip mined the intellectual property of our country, sold it off to Asia, and then they're wondering why the manufacturing jobs aren't here any longer. 
Yeah. Exactly. Wow. Well, I mean, um, so what do you th- how do you think our activists are doing, and uh, are are we on the right track? Are most activists focused on the right things that that mm-hmm. we need to counter all the the wrong things out there? Um, TPP, for instance, um, should we be focused on that more so than net neutrality or uh, oh global warming? Well, you know, we 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 could get lost in the fine details, and that's actually part of what the government would like to see happen. Where we're all arguing yeah. over was there a plane at the Pentagon and so forth. I think we, it's time for us all to step back and agree on the one thing we can all agree on: we live under a government that lies to us about pretty much everything, and we need to make that decision: are we willing to live with a government that lies to us to control us? to steal our wealth, to send our children off to wars of conquest? Are we willing to let our children grow up in a country with a government that lies to the extent this one does? And I think we can all pretty much come together around that one concept. And it doesn't matter if you're talking about human-caused global warming or vaccines are safe or GMO is healthy or the unemployment number is only 5.6. We know it's all lies. Uh, we're hard pressed to find anything the government has told us the truth about. In fact, <laughs> in fact, my theory is that the, the government doesn't dare tell the truth even once out of fear we might learn how to tell the difference. <laughs> Quite a good point. Wow, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, absolutely. Sure. Hey, yeah. Professional liars. So, uh, any any chance? Uh, I'm going back to the the uh, the FEMA camps and such. Any chance there's a set up for for dissidents and they have a they have a plan for you know they have every this all planned out and and know exactly what's going to happen and well if you look at how well their plans have gone so far in Iraq and Afghanistan and uh, Libya and Yemen I wouldn't worry <laughs> okay I mean they don't exactly have a stellar record of actually being able to carry their plans out they're going to cause a lot of damage they're going to hurt a lot of people there's no question about it. I'm convinced that all of these, uh, this race baiting that's out there is an attempt to get nationwide race riots as an excuse to declare uh, national emergency and martial law and say, oh, we've got to take the guns away from everybody. Uh, but so far, they haven't been able to get that to work either. And they've tried it with Trayvon Martin, George Zimmerman. Mm-hmm. Right. They tried right. it uh, in Ferguson. Uh, they tried it with uh, Freddie Gray. And uh, they're they're not getting the traction because the black people are just as smart as the white people, and we all realize yeah. that's what the government wants. And, and yes. another 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 big thing is the alternative media. I don't care what anybody says. Other people are, lo- are looking outside of. They're, they're realizing that the TV's a lie. Right. And speaking of and speaking of, I, I'll bring this up while you just said that, Mark. Is now we got the uh, the mainstream media starting to report some things that they normally wouldn't report, like um, this, this stuff with uh, recently with some Bin Laden. Finally, something's been printed. I think it was NBC recognized that uh, Obama was lying about uh, about the uh, Osama Bin Laden, the raid or whatever, because we know that was bullshit. Really? And he died back in 2000 and what, 2001, right, Mike? 2001, Mike? December of 2001, <laughs> natural causes, yes. kidney problems. Yes. Guy, right. been, yeah. guy was on dialysis. Yeah. Absolutely, exactly. Yep. Yes. Now, he didn't, he, didn't li- he didn't live for so many years after. He died years uh, before. Years before. <laughs> That's exactly what happened. Yeah, wag, okay, wag, the, wag the dead guy was basically what it is. Um, yes. Harvard University just did a survey, and they found that in the American population age 18 to 29, which is a major advertising demographic because they have the most disposable income they're making money but they're not saddled up with a bunch of debt yet only two percent of americans in that demographic think the uh, corporate media is being truthful and accurate only two percent and that is absolutely stunning and i'm sure that's one of the reasons why everybody's screaming that they they've got to outlaw politically incorrect speech uh, because they're finally realizing that with the independent media the blogs and the internet out here they can't lie with impunity to the people anymore. And if they can't do that, they don't know any other way to run a government than lies, fraud, and deception. They've been doing it too long. Right, right. No, no, that's the only thing that keeps them going. Absolutely. They, they, they can't, they, they can't uh, admit fault. Get too, they're too deep. 
they they can never admit fault. Uh, you know, they 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 don't admit it once because then all the other lies and cover-ups fall apart. Uh, they can't admit error. They can't turn around. Uh, we've seen that with Obamacare. That's been an absolutely unmitigated disaster for everybody involved. They're still out there promoting it. Uh, there's already an investigation of corruption in the state exchanges. Same thing with human-caused global warming. The world has been getting colder for 13 years, and still mm -hmm. they won't yep. back <laughs> off this screaming about, you icky-poo humans are warming the world, and you must pay a carbon tax to atone for it. Oh, shoot. But but you it, back to back to you have you know a whole bunch of people that'll go and and uh, y you know fight about it say you know how true it is and still I don't know it, it's sad people are yes, it just is. brainwashed beyond belief. Well, and, and that's well, what it's I mean. Start, it's that's starting to fall, about. though. It's starting to fall, though. I mean, you know, trust arrives on foot, but departs on horseback. And you can take a hundred years to build the trust of a people in its government, and one reckless, stupid lie, and it is gone, and it's not coming back. Saddam's nuclear weapons, obviously, being a big part of that, and uh, it, it is. It's a bit of a it, the, the government has a credibility problem of their own making, and I have no sympathy for them whatsoever. Oh, none, none. I just you're, you're a little more optimistic of of people than 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 myself. I still see it, just a, a lot of stupidity, and ignorance, and you know apathy. So that's just because you've been witnessing the flat yeah. earth the last couple of weeks, dude. It's yeah. just because what the flat earthers. <laughs> oh, the flat earthers. I've been dumbed down by the flat earthers. It's at least five used... percent of the population. They just hide in closets about it. I've paid yeah. zero attention to that at all. I, so. I, try, I, I, tr I try not to pay attention, but <laughs> I don't know. I, I, li I, I like science. I like physics. So when people yep. start talking about that stuff and saying that, you know, the, the space station <clears throat> isn't really up in orbit and we didn't go to the moon and, and all this stuff, like <laughs> I, can, I can see people stating the case where maybe we faked some moon landings. But we, it's Absolutely. not like they weren't all fate. That's just well. Uh, here, here, here's here's the deal. Okay, again, this gets back to the propaganda technique uh, <laughs> I mentioned called poisoning yeah. the well. Yeah. Where the government itself will put out this stuff and hope people will pick up on it because it makes us look ridiculous and discourages people from paying attention to more sure. serious things here. Uh, and uh, yeah, whether it's uh, uh, no plane uh, at the Pentagon or fake Apollo moon landings, which is kind of a hard one to keep selling because those Apollo landing sites have now been imaged by spacecraft from other countries, some yep. of whom yep. aren't friendly with us, and they're not going to go along with the lie. Exactly, so, exactly. Yeah. I've heard that NASA is the one who comes up with that uh, fake moon landing theory. Uh, I don't know who came up with it, but it was definitely put out there, you know, along with, you know, Harp is a weather machine and uh, uh, chemtrails and all the rest of it. And it's all basically out there uh, to make the general public think those of us in the independent media and the blogs are a bunch of nutcases. Yep. But, but with at this that, point, there, there is there's going to be some truth to a, a lot of that stuff. Like, um, no, there doesn't have I, to be. I, I it's from the U.S. government. It's total air. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, a lot of it, I, I agree. A lot of it gets blown way out of proportion. Yeah, like ninety-nine percent of it. But I, I, um, yeah, I, I, I think that a lot of a lot of that stuff is happening. Well, we're going to disagree on that one. And I come from a position uh, of experience because I actually worked on Apollo Twelve post mission. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Been there, done that. <laughs> actually, I, there you I, go. Actually, I actually got to uh, handle the remains of the Surveyor. Uh, yeah. Remember, Apollo 12 landed next to Surveyor 3, and they brought back pieces of it, which yeah. had been built at, at JPL, so they brought it back to us, and I got to actually you know, hold and touch and uh, do uh, proton luminescence yeah. studies on that stuff. Uh, uh, but I'm more meant, like you mentioned, you mentioned chemtrails, and, and I'm, yeah. not, I'm not saying necessarily that chemtrails, but that, that's, I guess, it would... Is what more that I was mentioning because you had mentioned that, and I mean I, I know that the you know, crowd seeding is real why, and, and that type of stuff. They, I think it's the reasons why, like why they're doing it. Like I think like my my like what I think is you know it's cloud seeding. I don't. Yeah. I personally don't think they're they're dropping a bunch of poison on us to make us sick. That's my opinion. But 
I do think they are spraying I something a, up there. I have a wild theory about that, and it's too wild to tell. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you for your discretion. Yeah. <laughs> but really, if you look at, I, I think. Well, I want to make that clear. And, all, and if you look at chemtrails or contrails, they've existed for a long time. They really have. What's surprising about them is the amount of aluminum that's in it. And they say that harp, you know, could, uh, it's aluminum serves as a good conductor. So harp can send its uh, frequency waves around and transmits other people's minds. Well, actually, I, I hate to spoil a good fairy tale here, but what harp actually <laughs> is, and other countries have similar facilities, uh, in the interval of time before surveillance satellites were really reliable and permanently up there, because you know, coming out of the Cold War era. Uh, a, a spy satellite would go up for only a few days, take a bunch of pictures, and then parachute back down with the film. And so there wasn't constant surveillance. So what HARP is, or was, uh, was a test bed for a synthetic aperture radar operating in the medium wave bands where they could bounce the beam off the ionosphere and image enemy ships and planes over the horizon. And they weren't able to really get it to work because the ionosphere is in constant motion. But basically, it's a lower frequency version of those synthetic aperture radars you see on the Aegis ships. And that was its real purpose. But, of course, they put out the story about its weather modification, its communicating with aliens, uh, in order to keep people from not figuring out what's really going on. A lot of people think the Air Force mounted Project Blue Book to cover up the existence of alien spacecraft. What Project Blue Book was actually there to do was to give everybody the idea of alien spaceships so that if you were out in the Nevada desert and you saw something flash overhead, you'd run around saying, I saw a flying saucer in an alien spaceship, and nobody would pay attention to you when what you'd actually had seen was the SR-71, the U-2, Have Blue, Senior Citizen, the Aurora, or any of the other mm -hmm. Black Project aircraft that are going on. PR-3B, right. Are you yeah, saying all, that you all don't of that UFOs stuff. and aliens are real? Okay. I am absolutely convinced the universe is full of intelligent life. I just can't think of a reason for them to bother stopping by here. <laughs> okay. So, um, <laughs> With so, all so due apologies to Professor Stephen Hawking, what have we got that they would be interested in? When you be, drive down the yeah. high, when, when, when you drive down the highway, do you stop at every anthill you pass? Yeah. <laughs> that's, a good point. That's, that's, that's a good point. <laughs> what if the aliens are here to harvest us? Uh, like I imagine it. that we're probably mm -hmm. as toxic to the uh, to the yeah. aliens. As, as, yeah, I mean, Star Trek always had aliens <sighs> looking like human beings because that saved money on the uh, the the makeup and wardrobe. But uh, I, I we we have life forms on this planet that if we eat them, we will die. And mm -hmm. I don't think our biochemistries are going to prove to be all that compatible where they're going to come down here and just open up the spaceship and walk around in spandex and beehive hairdos. They're going to have to be in environment suits. We're comfortable on Earth because we evolved here. The life forms down at the thermal vents in the bottom of the ocean are comfortable because they evolved down there. The fish right. in the Arctic in freezing water are comfortable there because that's where they evolved. Whatever is swimming around those methane pools on Titan is going to be very comfortable there because that's where they evolved. Every life form is going to be the product of the planet it evolved on, and unless we can actually find an exact duplicate of Earth somewhere, I don't think we're going to find uh, life forms that are going to be compatible. There's not going to be a giant galactic United Nations where we're all sitting together in one room on comfy chairs. Okay, so, so couldn't they just, in, in, you know, as far as our toxins are concerned, couldn't they just put us in an infrared sauna for a couple of weeks, clear out our toxins, and then eat us? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not talking about the added toxins. I'm talking about the ones that are in there. Uh, again, look at how much it costs to cross between stars in terms of energy. And remember, when you're in space, you can't just hit the brakes. If you're going from a star over there on the north to over on the south, and you want to stop at Earth, it doubles your energy costs. And there better be something down here that's worth all that trouble, not only to get here, but to lift whatever it is you want back up into space it's not really practical to be very honest and uh, uh, I think probably any alien spaceships looking down on us from outside they're going to see that our primary uh, activity continues to be tribal warfare and they're going to say what well, the heck with that thing you know we go down there we're going to get shot at 
You know, I, I did a little cartoon once of, of the, a Klingon cruiser approaching Earth, and the crewman says, ready to launch our attack on planet Earth, and the Klingon captain says, nah, it's not worth it, forget it. Right, <laughs> right. They'll, self, they'll, they'll self-destruct them on their own. They don't need their own. Not, it doesn't matter one way or the other, you know, it's just, they're not worth the notice. Like I said, passing anthills on the highway. That's true to our standards of technology, but if we manage to exist and survive for a million years, we're going to have technology that can go fast, I would imagine faster than the speed of light, to the point where we might even be able to jump vast distances of space. So what about these UFOs that people are seeing? Is that just all government technology, you suspect? I think for the, it's... Uh, I think it's government technology. It is honest mistakes of looking at stars. I remember when I was a kid living in West Covina, California, was a big news story about a UFO that was hovering over the San Bernardino Mountains. And um, I had built my first astronomical telescope, so I dragged it on over to uh, where we could see it, and it turned out it was just an out-of-control weather balloon. And I've seen things in the sky that I don't know what they were. But they right. certainly weren't acting like they were under the control of anybody who was uh, intelligent, or if they were, they were doing some serious <laughs> medication at the time. Uh, and and let's be very honest, if somebody's going to spend all the money to come all the way here to planet Earth, they're probably going to treat us the way Columbus treated the North American natives. Yeah. Okay. So um, those times that I have seen UFOs, you know, I mean, one flew directly above, you know, it was about, took up the whole sky. I've said this on the show a few times. I'm guessing that could have been government technology. But um, my point is, I, I, could this be just other dimensional? Could could there be some sort of beings on other dimensions? Or well, something this that... is all getting to hypothetical uh, speculation. Yeah. And, and, and again, <laughs> at this point, I am sure there is the universe is full of intelligent civilizations, far too intelligent to bother with us. I just don't see I don't think we have anything to offer them. Uh, they can, you know, uh, what was that? Aliens and uh, cowboys, they're, they're here to steal our gold. You can get a lot yeah. more gold out of the asteroid belt for a lot yeah. less cost. Yeah. Sure. You know, oh, they're going to take our water. Are you kidding? Water is one of the most abundant <laughs> things in the entire universe. You don't need to come down here to steal the water. And uh, uh, maybe they'll come down here and say, give us Chuck Berry or something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think you definitely don't believe that neighbor is going to pass next year. I'm sorry? I, I take it you definitely don't believe that Nibiru is going to pass next year. Uh, no, I, I, I don't. We, 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 whatever they're going to call it, Planet X, <laughs> the fantasy thing. Uh, I mean, they're always wagging that one around, and nobody comes up with any right ascension and declination coordinates where I can put my telescope on it. So right. there you go. Fair enough. Have okay. you read okay. uh, I had to Zachary get the crazy out of the way. Work? <laughs> I'm sorry. There were two people talking at the same time. Oh, I was asking if you've read uh, Zachary Fitchin's work. No, I have not. It's essential that we get the crazy out of the way. Yeah, the we... The Earth we, Chronicles. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I do like science fiction. I used to re, uh, read a lot of science fiction. Foundation Trilogy, obviously. Ringworld, Larry Niven. Um, uh, 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 the, um, uh, the whole Dune series. Uh, I love those as well. But, uh, again, there's science fiction, and then there's science fantasy, and I, 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 I stay on this side of the line with the stuff that's based on, uh, you know, at least known theoretical uh, possibilities right now. And that's, that's, that's my taste in science fiction. I, I wish somebody would make a movie out of Ringworld. I know a couple of people have tried, but Larry Niven has turned out to be, unfortunately, very difficult to deal with in terms of the licensing, the rights. Okay. Um, well, I'm under the impression that, I mean, you're probably right about the aliens not coming here. I'm going to say that's most likely not what's happening, but I am I definitely believe They're there's something right going here. on. Other dimensional Well, let me, let, let, me, let me share one more piece of information with you, and then I, I know <laughs> we're running out of time here. Uh, astronomers talk about stars in terms of what is called population one and population two stars, and the difference between them is... Population two stars are almost nothing but hydrogen. And the population one stars are stars like our sun, where they have a lot of heavy elements which are necessary for life to evolve and obviously to have a technological base. Now, the numbers are inverted because the population two stars come first, and then when they go supernova, that's when the heavy elements are created. They're in your body. 
If you do a survey of our local area of the galaxy, it turns mm-hmm. out our sun uh, is the pretty much the only population one star, and all the other stars around us are population two, which means there are no heavy elements on which to base biochemistry and life. So we're actually the oldest, wisest civilization, mm-hmm. at least in this part of town. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I could definitely agree with that, yeah. Wow, okay. Well, Doesn't it um, make you feel proud? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, man. <laughs> yeah. So what about another uh, uh, another um, world mimicking ours, another galaxy? Multiverse. Well, I mean, in a universe as large as this, I mean, uh, just out of random chance, yeah, there could be an exact copy of Earth someplace else out there. Uh, there might even be an exact copy of me. Heaven help them. Uh, but right. uh, it, it's an interesting mathematical exercise. Uh, but I, I, I know that we've got a certain amount of species chauvinism going on in our search of other worlds for life because looking for life as we know it on worlds just like ours, and I think that's too narrow a scope because uh, carbon-based chemistry with water as the mixing fluid, yeah, we know it works. We don't know for a fact that there's no other possibilities. Uh, I would very much like to see NASA send back a mission to Titan and see if there's anything swimming in those methane lakes because that would be a truly alien form of life. And right. I'm still convinced yeah. that we did detect indigenous life on Mars with the Viking mission. Uh, really? But, uh, uh, yeah, and uh, it was uh, the labeled release experiment by Dr. Gilbert Levin, and it showed a positive result, but there was a lot of politics going on. And to sort of put that in context, when Marco Polo came back from China to Europe, he was immediately grabbed and thrown into a dungeon by the church because the church was afraid that if ordinary people found out there was another great civilization far to the east who had never even heard of Jesus, that it was going to undermine the authority of the church, which was presenting an image of, you know, we are universal, God is everywhere, Jesus is everywhere, we're in charge, so you, you do what we tell you. Uh, fortunately, stories about what Marco Polo found leaked out, and eventually the church had to adjust and let him go. And... I know that for a lot of people in positions of power in this country, confirmation of life on any of the other planets, however microbial and minor, would be a socially transformative event. We human beings might just decide to put down our weapons of war and to put down our greed and unite together and say, hey, let's go find out who's out there. And that, of course, is going to be a tremendous loss for those whose lives are based on greed and war. And I think for that reason... Uh, we we were basically getting a lot of pressure on that mission uh, to not say anything about life, even though most of us felt we'd uh, proven indigenous life was there. And subsequent scientists looking at our raw data have said, yeah, this is the result you're supposed to get. Mm. I'm hearing all sorts of strange sounds on this feed. Yeah, I'm hearing buzzing. Yeah. Someone's vibrating. Yeah, it's the NSA. That gosh darn NSA. They got dirty, <laughs> lowest bitter alligator clips on the wires. I thought I was just. Good. I was just going to say you think they get some better technology for Jesus. Now it's all cost plus anyway. So how are we doing on time? <laughs> good question, Chris. You there, buddy? Oh no, I haven't checked my messages. He might have gotten no. booted. <laughs> no, no, we, oh, we, I'm back. I didn't realize oh, okay. I was on mute. I'm sitting here talking, and I didn't realize you guys could talk. <laughs> surprise, surprise, surprise. I was trying to, trying to figure out what that click that clicking was coming from. It was bugging me, so I was sending everybody messages like, what is that clicking? It's bugging me. Then I send the message to Michael, and then I hear, Rrr. so that's Michael's phone. <laughs> Michael, but anyway, yes, trouble, we, <laughs> we, are, we are coming to the end here, um, and it's almost break time. But uh, awesome conversation, though. I didn't expect to talk about stuff that we just talked about, so that was uh, awesome. I, and I know the listeners loved it. We seem to uh, do good when we talk about that kind of stuff, too. Okay. People like the people like the conspiracy yeah. stuff. 
Yeah, you I had to I mean? talk about aliens. Sorry. Keep it <laughs> yeah. Well. Yeah, we aliens, right? <laughs> you know uh, that that's all. That's always good for like Jeff Rents and everything, who we're all yeah. of course hoping is going to uh, recover fully oh, from yeah. his accident. Yeah. Uh, but uh, my my website for 21 years is I stay away from that kind of stuff because right. uh, I'm I'm really about politics and peace and yep. and stopping this insane rush to war. Uh, and even though I personally love science, uh, you know, I, I, I stay away from some of that uh, wilder stuff until I know for a fact that there's something actually there. And I'm, I'm probably one of the most skeptical people that you're going to meet in terms of some of these things. Well, like chemtrails and harp and so forth. Uh, sure. So yeah. if we and I realize find... the truth is nowhere near as much fun. And I'm just a party <laughs> pooper in a wet blanket. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll, go, I, I'll go hide in the closet now. I think you're a little optimistic <laughs> about us uh, becoming anti-war if we find uh, life in the oceans of other planets, though. That I think we'll somehow justify that and just pretend it, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, I would disagree, and it's not a case of being anti-war. It's just all of a sudden war not being the most important thing to us. Right. Okay. I agree with that. Okay. Yeah, I, like Nikola like Tesla said, peace is only a natural consequence of universal enlightenment. All right. Okay. Breaking out the Tesla quote. You, you, you awesome. remember that quote. <laughs> I love Tesla. Thank you. I do, too. <laughs> Michael Michael always seems to uh, remember the quotes. That's I good, though. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah, but I can't remember my cheat sheet for my final. <laughs> God, I bombed that shit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I never did. I was always good with the cheating. Never got caught once. We got Tom Brady over here. <laughs> no. All right. Yeah. All right. <laughs> anyway, now, you, now we went. We went to going to. We went to from entertaining the fans to completely boring them. Uh, boring you. You're the. You're the only one that doesn't like talking about the stuff. I'm the only one who doesn't like talking about Tom Brady's balls. Yes. Sports in general. <laughs> anyway. Anyway. Michael. Mike. Mike. Sorry. <laughs> Great to have you on. I guess. Stop <laughs> laughing, guy. <laughs> anyway, so yeah. Anyway, great to have you on. Thanks for coming on. Well, um, thank you thank- for having me. Definitely. And uh, yeah, if you want to plug plug anything right now, go go ahead. Well, just two things. First of all, my website, whatreallyhappened.com, and from there you can find your way to my talk radio show on GCN. Uh, But the most important thing for all of us right now is to find the courage to speak out about what's going on, about what we know, about our concerns that, hey, the government's now admitting that they lied at least in part about the raid that got bin Laden. And it's a shame the corporate media doesn't have the courage to take that next step and say, that wasn't really bin Laden anyway. They lied about... uh, Saddam's nuclear weapons, they lied about torpedoes in the Gulf of Tonkin, they lied about Spanish mine in Havana Harbor, lied about Lusitania not carrying weapons. When are you going to wake up and realize you live under a government that lies to you all the time, and once you make that recognition, what are you going to do about it? When you have the courage to speak out, you will give courage to those around you to speak out, and that is how public consensus will form. Yep. Well said. I agree with that. Well said. Well, it's it's been a uh, pleasure talking to you tonight, Mike. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. And uh, keep 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 warm. Keep warm over there in Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. It's 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 been warm here in Maine, so I can't complain. Oh, I heard there were frost warnings uh, up in the north part of the state last night. Uh it was a. Yeah, it wasn't too bad last night. I I got to keep my window open in my room, so it wasn't too mm-hmm. bad. No, well, mid state's been this early. All right. Decent. Well, if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and punch this little button. Yep. And say good night. All right. Got it. <laughs> All right. I have, have to go one, on to, to to something else now. Have a good right, Have a good care. evening, Mike. Thank you. Aloha. The U.S. is trying to arm twist people to go along with it because the ultimate goal of all of these treaties is the U.S. is desperate to try and lock the world back into a a U.S. dominated economic system similar to Bretton Woods in the post World War II years or the world under the petrodollar. Uh, before the U.S. dollar really starts to come apart, at which point everybody's just going to head for the uh, exits. 
and not want to be part of this any longer. But uh, uh, we're, we're at a situation where the U.S. Is, is trying to basically get the world back to the Bretton Woods-like agreement, where it doesn't matter what happens to the dollar because the rest of the world is locked to the dollar. Uh, but I, I think a lot of the other countries are not going to go for it. Certainly Russia and China are adamant they are not going to sign on to any economic agreement that basically cedes their sovereignty to the United States or the United States corporations. Oh, yeah, the dollar is tanking. I keep thinking it's going to be the bottom, but it just keeps going down. So, I mean, Well, remember in a currency war, they're actually trying to lower its value, but the U.S. is losing the currency war. And it's getting pretty desperate out there right now. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. It, seemed, it almost seems like the euro is overpowering the dollar, or is it about well, to? Well, not, not the euro <laughs> so much. The euro and the dollar have been sort of maintaining parity all along. The real problem is the rise of the ruble, the renminbi, and the yuan, which right. are very powerful currencies. And you've got uh, all these parallel financial systems being set up, like BRICS and the... Uh, uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, and yep. they're all basically operating outside the U.S. dollar. Uh, and that, of course, means that Wall Street does not get a piece of the action. See, at the end of World War II, uh, the U.S. government's price to Great Britain to bring the American people into World War II was that the British pound sterling would surrender its role as the global trade and banking currency and allow the dollar to take over. Now, back during World War II when accounts were still being settled with bullion or boxes of paper notes, it did make sense to have a single global currency that everybody could rely on. In these days of global instantaneous financial transactions, it's really an obsolete concept. But what happened is the United States made a huge amount of money just being the global currency because before anybody could conduct commerce across a border, they would first have to come to the Federal Reserve and borrow dollars at interest, or they would have to bring manufactured goods and agricultural produce to the United States to get those ink and paper tickets. And so literally the U.S. was making a huge profit off the fact that the dollar was the global trade and banking currency. And over the subsequent decades, Wall Street got kind of lazy. They started saying, we don't need to manufacture, we don't need to grow food. We can let all the high-paying jobs go to other countries because we're making this guaranteed income from Bretton Woods. Then Nixon ended gold convertibility, which technically was the end of Bretton Woods, and the U.S. went out and they established the petrodollar deal, where the U.S. went to all the resource-rich oil companies, mostly in the Middle East, and they said, we'll make you a deal. As long as you saw, sell your oil only for U.S. dollars and invest those dollars in the U.S., we will guarantee your military safety. And so, once again, the world had to come borrow dollars at interest in order to buy oil or bring us products and agricultural produce for those ink and paper tickets before they could buy oil. And that deal kept global demand for the dollar high up until recently. Uh, But starting back basically at the turn of the millennium, a lot of countries started saying there's no reason for us to have a single global currency. And in 2002... Iraq got permission from the United Nations to start selling Iraq's oil for the euro. One year later, the United States, screaming weapons of mass destruction, invades Iraq, lynches Saddam Hussein, puts in a new puppet government, and Iraq's oil is on the world market, but only for the U.S. dollar. Over in Libya, you had Muammar Gaddafi shut down their private central bank, set up a state bank with a brand new value-based currency, the gold dinar. Then he announced to the world that Libya's oil was for sale, but only for the gold dinar. The U.S. invades, they kill Gaddafi, they put in a private central bank, the gold for the gold dinar, nobody knows where that went, and Libya's oil is back on the world market, but only for the dollar. And that's really what's driving a lot of this war agenda, to just keep all global commerce going through the U.S. dollar, from which Wall Street and the Federal Reserve make a huge amount of money. And... Unfortunately, we're starting to see all these parallel systems start up, BRICS, uh, Asian uh, Infrastructure Investment Bank, and the U.S. is trying to stop that with these transoceanic treaties. And they're running into a lot of resistance. And frankly, the only thing the United States has got to negotiate with is, you go along with us on the treaty or we'll overthrow your government the way we did Kiev, put in a puppet ruler, and your successor will do what we want. And that's what's brought this world right literally to the edge of a nuclear world war. 
You you just broke it down exactly the way it is. Yep. Yeah. I guess I have a question. Uh, you said the Russian ruble is getting stronger, but I thought it went down 50%. I think it was these last couple months. It went down briefly because the U.S. and Saudi Arabia put together this little deal to crush world yeah. oil prices. And uh, Russia's a... <laughs> it's oh my going God. fine here. Uh, Mike, you know. <laughs> oh, yes, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> I'm already yeah, messing it you... up. Yeah, yes. I am Mike. I like Mike. <laughs> okay, perfect. Because we don't we don't call Michael Mike, so this works out great. <laughs> so how's it going over there in Hawaii? Well, uh, it's unusually cool for this time of year. Uh, otherwise, it's uh, you know alternating between uh, showers and sun, and we're getting into tourist weather. It's uh, tourist season, but they won't let us shoot any of them. <laughs> I understand they taste like chicken, and in this economy, that may become an issue. That's, yeah. <laughs> no. So you said it's you said it's a little cool over there. So uh, what's uh, no no uh, global warming? Uh, not here, and certainly not across uh, many parts of the United States. Uh, they've got actually frost warnings in a lot of states for tonight. They're getting more snow around Las Vegas and California, Big Bear. Uh, all these uh, tourist areas were getting ready to start their springtime and, and summer activities. They're having to delay them. So, uh, yeah, I'm afraid this whole global warming thing really didn't work out quite the way Al Gore wanted it to. Yeah. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah, so, so when when is everything going to melt? Uh, well, it will sometime, but, uh, you know, very obviously, uh, the, the reality is the Earth has been cooling for about 12, 13 years now. The Arctic ice caps are increasing. And unfortunately, the people who are pushing this global warming situation, uh, they're driven partly by the desire to sell us products, agendas, carbon taxes, carbon credits, and partly by the fact that they've bet their reputations on this human-caused global warming, and they're trying to figure a way where they can somehow get out of this without looking like they were part of, at the very most generous, a horrendous scientific goof, uh, or more realistically, they were part of this agenda to take something that happens naturally, claim it was all the fault of human beings to guilt us out of money and obedience. Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, people are are waking up, I would assume, by now. I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't assume much. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't don't assume that completely because we still have people that think the Earth is flat. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is true, I, I, Mike. I don't know if, if you've uh, been with us since that last time, but we've been uh, doing a lot of debating with flat Earth. There's a lot of people who believe the, the Earth is actually flat. Uh boy, that's that's a that's a tough one to to get into, and I. Uh, I, I understand that the Bible teaches that, but I sort of hope that we'd evolve past that stage. Yes. Yeah. We did, too, until about a month ago. <laughs> you sure it's not somebody pulling your ankle? Oh, no. No, no, no. They These are people are rich. dead serious. We thought that they were at first, but no, they're they're really uh, they're serious. It's, yeah. we, we, actually, we actually did a show. <clears throat> not that I wanted to give it a lot of attention, but... We ended up doing a show, and we had a physicist come on, and we talked about it with him. So, and uh, yeah, and I put that up on YouTube, and so people that go and search for flat Earth, they come up, they come to that, and uh, it's mostly these flat Earthers that are coming up. So there's, there's like, probably like, I mean, there's like, I don't know, fifty or sixty dislikes compared to like maybe like ten likes on on oh, yeah. the video right now. <laughs> That's that's definitely a, a little bit out there, and uh, that, that, that's that's definitely out there. But you know, unfortunately, people can be slaves to belief. Uh, it's it's a big issue. Uh, that's what's driving a lot of the adherence to uh, uh, to the global warming agenda. Uh, a lot of Hillary's support is just from people who believe that she's <laughs> whatever it is she pretends to be. Oh. I believe she's psychotic. Uh, sociopathic. Right. I, I'll go as far as sociopathic and uh, 
Uh, sociopaths, unfortunately, make very, very good, convincing liars and, and wonderful politicians. Yep. That's what they do. Wow, so... Uh, so, so fast-track uh, fast list today. Fast-track, that's right, yeah. Yes. Yes, today. It got, yeah. today? It got declined, right? No, nah, it did originally. No, no. Then the yeah. Democrats made a came up with a compromise situation, and uh, yeah, it's now moving forward. Now it may be fast tracked here in the United States, where Congress is, just doesn't want to be bothered with the negotiations, just like they don't want to be bothered declaring war. But by golly, they want to be involved in the possibility that we might make peace with Iran. Uh, but it's still a long ways away from actually getting the treaty signed by all these other uh, nations who are part of this. Uh, mostly because uh, there's a lot of stuff that's been added in there. A lot of nations are very concerned about the loss of sovereignty, uh, the, uh, their, their own governmental functions being transferred uh, literally to corporate bodies. Uh, a lot of the countries are very bothered by some of the uh, uh, amendments that were put in there regarding uh, GMO labeling. Uh, the TPP and the uh, TTIP both basically ban GMO labeling. Israel's trying to get this treaty to include... Uh, a ban on the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement around the world. Uh, and it, there, it's meeting a lot of resistance. And the economy, export economy is very heavily into oil and gas, and it did harm Russia's ruble, but it kind of backflashed against uh, United States oil companies. A lot of fracking companies went out of business. Canada's oil company was uh, suffering huge losses. Venezuela has been put to the edge of bankruptcy by this. And Russia's economy is already rebounding from the sanctions, so is Iran's, because there are way too many countries on planet Earth who are just willing to ignore what the U.S. wants and continue to carry out commerce. You've even got Boeing in the United States and Germany starting to do business with Iran again, and pretty much all of Europe is saying it's time for these Russian sanctions to go. They're hurting us more than they hurt the Russians. It's just the U.S. out there trying to throw its weight around and bully everybody into going back to the 1950s, when, you know, again, the United States and the dollar was the center of all global commerce. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Makes so, uh, pretty much the uh, ruble recovered a little, did it? Uh, yeah, it has. They're, they're actually doing very well over there. Nice. So what do you think their plans are for the dollar? Are they just trying to make it stronger? Try to, like you said, some sort of new uh, Bretton Woods okay. agreement? Well, the Bretton Woods Agreement is to basically lock all of the world's economies back to the dollar. Uh, so it doesn't matter whether the dollar goes up or down because everybody else's currencies will go up and down with it together. Uh, the, the other currencies are pegged to the dollar. The exchange rates are locked that way. And that's what the original Bretton Woods did. But I, I, I don't think they're, they're going to be able to get enough nations to come on board where it's really going to do much of anything except isolate the United States and those who signed the treaty from the rest of uh, the world's economy. And, you know, uh, Asia is booming up, huge manufacturing uh, capacity over there. Russia, they're able to run their economies without the United States, and that is really the part that is considered a threat to the United States, is you have countries around the world doing business with each other without going through the dollar. Uh, China has signed eight direct currency exchange agreements, uh, with uh, other nations, including Russia, and amazingly, Australia. Even Australia is saying, we don't need to go through the dollar to do business with China. And because the United States financial system stopped thinking of itself as a manufacturing and agricultural power and saw itself merely as the financier to the world, uh, they've become dependent on that mafia-like piece of the action from everybody else's right. commerce, and that's why they're willing to start initiating wars to drag the world back to the way it was in the 1950s. And they're meeting a tremendous oh. amount of resistance. Hmm. So what happens next?